Hey, welcome back to the course. So in this lecture, let's write a Hello World program for our embedded board, which is based on ARM Cortex M4 processor. So now in our case, we'll start a new STM32 project. So to create a new STM32 project, go to File and then go to New and then click on STM32 project. So after that, just select this option and click Next. So now you have to give a name for your project. So I'm going to give 001 Hello World. And after that, the language is C. And here, targeted project type, select empty. And after that, click Finish. All right, so we just created an empty Hello World project. So it has added a couple of folders here. So the ink folder or include folder, which is so where we keep all our header files of our project and the source folder so where we keep all our source codes that is .c files and here you can see that the um, IDE is already added three files main.c, syscalls.c, sysmem.c and after that important thing here is the startup code for the microcontroller so before working with any microcontroller okay doesn't matter whether it is from ST or whether it is from TI or Freescale or whatever it is so you should have a startup code for that microcontroller in your project. So that is very, very important. And uh, so for this lecture, we are not going to explore the startup code because that would be too early to explore. But in later sections, I have a plan to introduce writing startup file from scratch. So we'll see that later when we understand more about the microcontroller and the embedded C concept. So the main thing here what you should observe is it has added main source file where we are going to write our code for the microcontroller. All right, now let's write a program to print the message hello world. So for that, let's use the standard library function printf. Let me write printf hello world. And since it's a standard library function, I have to include stdio.h. All right, so now you may be wondering how would this print work because we don't have any display or standard output device which is connected to our embedded board, right? So we don't have any monitor or we don't have an LCD which are connected to our embedded board. So how are we going to see the output then? For that, that is one solution. And that solution comes from the ARM Cortex processor itself. Let's explore that. All right, now let's discuss about using printf outputs on ARM Cortex M3 or M4 or M7 based MCUs. This discussion is only applicable to microcontrollers which are based on ARM Cortex M3 plus processors, M3 or M4, M7 or higher. So this discussion will not be applicable to ARM Cortex M0 or M0 plus processors. So in that case, you will not be able to use the ARM Cortex processor's trace functionality, so which we are going to discuss in a moment. In ARM Cortex processor, we can make printf work by using the SWO pin of the SWD interface. So SWO stands for Serial Wire Output. Let's explore more on this. First of all, this is your board, right? So you have a board which is STM32F4 discovery board or nuclear board. And your board has a microcontroller, right? So let's say the microcontroller is STM32F407VG. So this is a microcontroller which is produced by ST Microelectronics. That microcontroller has a processor inside, right? Which is ARM Cortex M4 processor, right? Now our board also has one more circuitry, so which is at the front end of the board and that we call as ST-Link V2 or V1 debug circuitry. So that is ST-Link onboard debug circuitry. So by using that debug circuitry, your PC communicates with the board. Through that debug circuitry, you actually write your program to the internal flash of the microcontroller. You read various memory locations of the microcontroller. You make processor run. You make processor stop. 
So all those debug related activity you do by taking help of this debug circuitry, which is present on the board. Debug circuitry will talk to your PC over a USB connection. So that is a pin called SWO pin, which is coming all the way from ARM Cortex M processor and it is connected to the debug circuitry. So the printf actually works over this SWO pin. Let's explore further. So for that, I'm going to zoom this ARM Cortex M4 processor. Let's consider only ARM Cortex M4 processor. So inside the ARM Cortex M4 processor, there is a unit or a peripheral called ITM unit. ITM stands for Instrumentation Trace Microcell Unit. So this is inside the processor. So the ITM is an optional application driven trace source that supports printf style debugging to trace operating system and application events and it can also be used to generate diagnostic system information. So this unit is only available in ARM Cortex M3 or above processors. So it is not available in ARM Cortex M0 processor. And to debug the processor, so debug means if you want to read the memory location, if you want to read the processor related register, if you want to make the processor halt or if you want it to run, so if you want to do all these activities, then we do that using the debug interface. The debug interface, what we are using here is SWD. So SWD stands for Serial Wire Debug, which is a two-wire protocol for accessing the ARM debug interface. SWD works over SWD connector, and that SWD connector has three pins in which two pins are used for debug and one pin is used for trace. So trace means in order to get the trace related information from the processor. Let's explore some more points about SWD debug interface. Now the serial wire debug, it is a two wire protocol for accessing ARM debug interface. So it is part of the ARM debug interface specification V5 and it is an alternative to JTAG. The physical layer of SWD consists of only two lines. One is called SWDIO, which is a bidirectional data line which carries debug related data and SWD clock, a clock which is driven by the host. So in our board, the host is actually the ST-Link circuitry. So SWDIO, uh, which is a data line which actually carries the debug related commands. So like for example, when you insert a breakpoint in your IDE, so that information will be sent over SWDIO data line to the processor. So if you want to stop the processor from the IDE, then that information is actually carried over the SWD IO line with the help of SW clock to the processor. So in order to talk to the processor, you can use these two pins of the SWD interface, SWD IO and SW clock. So both are managed by the ST-Link circuitry, which is present on your boards. So by using SWD interface, you should be able to program MCU's internal flash. You can access memory regions, add breakpoints, stop or run the CPU. So other good thing about SWD is you can use the serial wire viewer for your printf statements for debugging. So as I said, SWD comes with only two pins which are used for debug, but there is one optional pin that is what we call as SWO, which we can use for printf functionality. So now there is also another debug interface, which is called as JTAG. The difference between JTAG and SWD is JTAG actually needs more pins than SWD. JTAG was the traditional mechanism for debug connections for ARM7 or ARM9 family, but with Cortex-M family, ARM introduced the serial wire debug interface. SWD is designed to reduce the pin count required for debug from the four used by JTAG down to two. So in addition, SWD interface provides one more pin called SWO, which is used for single wire viewing, which is a low cost tracing technology. 
let's move forward so if I zoom this ITM unit further so what you see is a FIFO or you can call it as a buffer or a register it's a hardware buffer which is there inside the ITM unit so now all you need to do is write the printf data into this FIFO so that FIFO is actually connected to the SWO pin which is coming out of the processor and it is coming all the way to your debug circuitry which is present on the board right so the moment your printf writes into this FIFO that messages will actually come over the SWO pin and you then capture it that's it so in the IDE there is a provision to capture this SWO pin so remember that not all IDEs support this feature of capturing SWO pin so but fortunately STM32 Cube ID and True Studio so those IDs actually support these functionalities so SWO pin is connected to ST-Link circuitry of the board and can be captured using our debug software so let's see that in a moment how to do that but this is the idea behind how printf works in ARM Cortex MX processor so there is ITM unit and it has a FIFO and your printf somehow should write into that FIFO and that FIFO is connected to the SWO pin and through that you actually get that message back to the ID. Alright so now in our application so you have to do some settings or you have to add some code in order to make your printf writes into that ITM's FIFO. So for that you have to add a small code snippet so that code you can get in our repository so you just go to the git repository and here just copy this code so once you copy this code so what you have to do is you have to open the project and go to syscalls.c so in the syscall.c so after this hash include just paste that code all right so and after that just save this file so this is actually the implementation of printf like feature using ARM Cortex ITM functionality and this function will not work for ARM Cortex M0 or M0 plus so if you are using Cortex M0 then you can use semi hosting feature of open OCD so which I covered in a separate video and this is a code what we added and which actually writes into that FIFO so now let's go to the syscos.c and here you should identify a function called write here is a function called write so what you have to do is you have to comment out this line so instead of that call this function itm send char so just call that function here and give this argument right so instead of calling this you are just calling our itm message sending function so that's all you have to do and after that you are ready to test this application all right so what's happening here is that so when you call a printf function which is actually a standard library function so the printf function is actually implemented in C standard library right so the printf implementation then calls lower level function called write so that write is actually implemented in syscalls.c and in that write we actually call our API ITM send char in order to populate the ITM's FIFO and that's how we actually divert the printf to the ITM unit and then we get the trace through the SWO pin suppose if you have LCD then you can call LCD send char here so if you have UART then you can call UART send char here so now after that in order to test this application you have to first compile it isn't it so that what we call as cross compilation right so now in order to compile this program so all you need to do is just select the project and then right click and then click on build project or you can also select the project and click on this build icon here let's compile the code so here you can see that under console you should be seeing these logs so here you can see that this is a compiler invoked by this ID and by the way you need not to worry about installing cross compiler here so because all the build tools cross compilation tools everything is installed by the ID everything comes with the ID so you need not to install anything extra 
So if you want to upgrade this compiler to the newer version, then you may have to change the compiler settings and that we'll see later. So, but other than that, so I don't think you need to touch any compiler settings as of now. So this is a cross compiler that is ARM NUN EABI GCC, which is used to compile this source code for the target architecture. All right, so what is cross compilation? So cross compilation means uh, you actually compile a program with the intention of producing code for some other architecture. For example, uh, in this case, uh, we are using the cross compiler ARM NUN uh, EABI GCC. So this is a cross compiler, okay? And this cross compiler uh, runs on the host machine but it produces executable for different machine. For example, in this case, the target machine is different. Uh, it is based on ARM architecture. So that's why a uh, compiler is called as a cross compiler when it runs on one architecture, but it produces the code for different architecture. So that compiler is called as cross compiler and the process is called as cross compilation. So here, uh, the cross compiler actually produces uh, different types of uh, executables, okay, for the target. So these are all the uh, different executable types, like uh, .elf, .bin, .hex, okay. So .elf is a type of executable which stands for executable and linkable format. Uh, it's a type of executable uh, which is used for debugging, okay. So .bin and .hex are type of executables which are actually pure binary executables uh, which are used for productions, okay? .elf is used during debugging. So suppose if you are giving an executable of your project to your customer, uh, then you should be giving .bin or .hex, not .elf, remember. Because ELF has all the information, all the debug information, and anyone can use ELF analyzers to, you know, to read what are the contents of the ELF, and they, they will come to know about the code implementation, everything, okay? So because there are tools uh, available to analyze .elf files, and they can disassemble the code, and they can get the information about the project, okay? In this course, we'll be using .elf format because in this course, we'll be debugging our code on the target, isn't it? So debugging uh, is not possible if you use .bin or .hex. As I said, those are pure binary files and those are used during production, okay? And what is native compilation? So native compiler means the compiler runs on a host machine and produces executable, which also runs on the same machine, okay? So this process is called as native compilation. All right, so, so far, whatever uh, the uh, code we wrote for our uh, PC, that is actually native compilation, okay? Let's move forward. So here we actually got .elf of Hello World project. After that, we have to now load this project into our target. So now for that, you have to first connect the target to your machine. I'm going to connect the target to my machine. And after that, just right click here and go to debug as and click on debug configurations. So here, just double click on this STM32MCU debugging. So it creates a debug configuration here. And uh, the name, you can keep this as it is, no problem. So it actually tries to load this file that is .elf which is created during the compilation, which is right here. And so don't change anything here. Go to debugger and here you should be selecting stlink GDB server. So it also has option for open OCD, but we'll be using stlink. So here and after that interface is SWD. And after that, here is an option for serial wire viewer. So just enable that. And after that, Core clock is 16 megahertz, so you can keep that. And after that, SWO clock, which is default to 2000 kilohertz, and you can keep that, no problem. And after that, you need not to do anything here. In the startup also, you need not to do anything. Just click on apply, and after that, you can click close. And after that, right click on this project, and you can again go to the debug as and select this one, STM32MCU application. 
the IDE will load the project into the target hardware and it will switch into the debug perspective. The IDE is asking you to change the perspective into debug perspective. So for that, you can click switch. So here you can see that the code is loaded onto the target and the execution is stopped at the very first instruction of the main function. This is what IDEs usually do. So they will halt the execution at the first instruction of the main. The processor is halted. So because the ID is stopped here. Fine. So now how to see this printf. So for that what you have to do is go to window and then go to show view and then go to SWV that is serial wire viewer and then go to SWV ITM data console. So just click on that. So it will appear at the bottom here. And here click on this configure trace and select the port 0. So just select this port and after that click on OK. Let's run the code. So to run the code at one go you had to click this resume button. Let's run the code. I'm going to click this. So actually you didn't see that message here. That's because you have to start the trace. So now let's reset the board. You can reset the board from ID itself. You need not to keep pressing the reset button of the board. So you can do that from here. Reset the chip and restart debug session. Let me reset. So now let's click on this start trace button here. This console is ready to accept data on the SWO pin. Let's hit run. Here it is. We got the message hello world. So what's happening here? So printf is going to standard library. From standard library it is coming to the write function and in the write function it is going to the ITM FIFO. And from that ITM FIFO it is coming over SWO pin all the way back to the ID. And for any reason if you are not able to use SWV that is serial wire viewer then you can use semi hosting using open OCD debugger that I covered in the next lecture. So, so watch the next lecture only if you can't use this feature. I'll see you in the next lecture. Hey, welcome back. So I just wanted to talk about an issue with uh, with the STM32 cube ID. Okay. Now this issue is related to the debugging session of the IDE and um, you may also encounter it so uh, if you encounter it then uh, you can troubleshoot it okay so that i will discuss now so now let's say i have a simple project here okay so let's say uh, hello world and uh, let me debug this project first okay now let me load and debug so i would be selecting uh, debug as right so debug as stm32 application now let's do that here you can see that um, the IDE is going into the debug perspective, right? Let's click switch. Right, so everything is as expected. And here you can see that uh, this is a debug perspective, okay? So let me just enable this tracing and let me test this. So you can see that there are some unknown characters. So what you can do is you can just click on remove all collected data and you can reset the chip and you can try once again. So let's do that. Okay, now it works. Now let's say you want to go back to your C and C++ perspective, that is your editing perspective. So what you should be doing is, you should be terminating this debug session, isn't it? Now there are two termination options. One is terminate and another one is uh, terminate and relaunch, okay? So if you click this, the debug session will be terminated but it will again relaunch all right now let me click this terminate and when when i click that you can see that the ide automatically went back to the c++ perspective okay where you can uh, again edit your code and you can build your code and you can again debug so now let's again try to debug okay now let me again try to debug the code and here you can see that it again goes into the debug perspective, right? That's correct, okay? So this should be the normal behavior. But the problem comes when 
there is one more terminate button here. Now the problem comes when you use this button to terminate the debug session. So now let's use that button, okay, to terminate the debug session. I'm clicking that and here you can see that the debug session is terminated and the perspective is changed back to the C and C++ perspective. Now try to again debug the code. And here is a problem. Okay. Now it says that error in final launch sequence. Now this error is observed in newer versions of STM32 cube ID. Okay. In the older versions, okay, I didn't find these problems. I don't know whether it's a known bug or it may not be a bug. So now the workaround for this issue is very simple. Just click OK and go to the debug perspective manually. Right click on this option terminate and remove okay and then go back to the c and c plus plus perspective after that again try to debug the code and this time it should work i don't know whether you will face this issue or not but if you face this issue then just use this workaround okay or don't use this terminate button always use this terminate button great so i'll see you in the next lecture All right, so in the previous video, we used ARM Cortex M4 processor's ITM feature to get the prints over SWO line of the debugger, right? And this won't work if you are using Cortex M0 based STM32 microcontroller. So we can try open OCD based semi hosting technique. So that I'm going to explain in this video. By the way, OpenOCD is a debugger which helps you to program and debug your code on the board. Okay, it stands for Open On Chip Debugger. So to get the prints using OpenOCD debugger, you have to do a couple of settings in the project. All right, now let's go to our IDE and um, I have created a, a new project here. Hello world underscore semi hosting. So now first what you have to do is you have to uh, build this project. Okay, so let's build this. All right, so now the binary is generated here, the .elf file. Okay, then what you have to do is right click on this project and go to debug configurations. Okay, here. All right, and then go to STM32MCU debugging. Just expand that. Okay, here click on new launch configuration so now we are going to create a debug configuration for our .elf file so now here in the debugger you have to change the debugger now the debug probe or debug software you have to change so earlier we used stlink right so that is actually the default one for the stm32 cube ide now you have to change this to open OCD. So that is the first change you have to do, change the debugger, okay? And after that, go to startup. And in the startup tab, so you have to mention the semi-hosting run command, okay? And this command is this one, monitor arm semi-hosting enable. So just copy this, okay? I have given this command in the resource section. So just download that, okay? Go to the IDE and paste here, all right, and click on apply, and then click on close, all right. And after that, right click on the project and go to properties, go to C++ build and go to settings, go to tool settings here, go to linker and go to miscellaneous, and here you have to mention these linker arguments okay all right now let's copy these linker arguments and here just click on plus here and just paste that flags click ok and click apply here and apply and close and now go to your src and go to main.c 
And now here, let's write some code, okay? So let me copy the same code from the earlier project. Let me copy this. All right, now let me paste here. And here, before using any print apps, okay? So you have to add this function call in the main function, okay? So just copy this statement. And before using any print, so just call this function. And also you should add its prototype. So here is a prototype of that. So add the prototype here. And after that, one more important thing you have to do, that is you have to exclude this syscalls.c from the build. All right. So for that, just right click on syscalls.c file, go to properties, and go to C, C++ build and check this exclude resource from build okay apply apply and close that's it okay so now this file is excluded from the build and after that just build the project so your project should build successfully here you can see that the project built successfully and then connect your hardware to the pc and after that just debug the code as stm32 c application Okay. All right, now click on switch. And here you can see that uh, it went to debug perspective. And this is a log which is uh, produced by open OCD debugger. And here you can see that semi hosting is enabled. So now you can get the prints right here on the console. So let's just step over. Okay, and now let's step over one more time, and here it is. You just got the print. Great, so remember that while using prints, using printf in semi-hosting, this slash n is really important, okay? You should not miss that. The string should end with slash n when you are using printf under semi-hosting with open OCD debugger. So you can use this feature whenever you want to debug your project using uh, prints, okay? So that's about getting prints using OpenOCD and semi-hosting uh, on STM32 Cube ID, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Welcome back to the lecture. So now let's do one more exercise on our embedded target. So now by using size of operator, find out storage sizes of the below data types for your cross compiler. Similar thing we actually did in the earlier part of the course where we used size of operator on our machine to print out the data size values for the various standard data types which are available in C. Same thing you have to do, but in this case you have to do for embedded target. And after that you can use the printf statement in order to print the result, something similar to this. And you can create a new project no problem but whenever you create a new project you would have observed here the IDE actually creates a main function and it adds this statement at the end of the main function so this is called C's loop statement so about loop statements we are going to explore in later part of the course but please note that this is a for loop and this is the implementation of infinite loop when the execution control reaches here, processor actually hangs here executing this infinite loop. And why it is required, we will explore that in the next lecture. So just keep this for loop at the end of the main function. Go ahead and create a new project for the size of experiment and I'll see you in the next lecture. Welcome back to the lecture. So I just created a new project here, 002 size of. I am going to use printf here. Again, I have to edit the syscalls.c. So what I suggest you to do is just go to the syscalls.c of previous project. Just copy everything here and then go to your new project and control A, select everything, delete everything and paste whatever you copied from the previous project. So that will be the quickest method to do. So remember that this is required only if you want to use printf functionality. Let me implement 
the size of code here. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first use uh, the stdio.h. Let me include that file first. And after that, let me use printf to print the size of a char data type. So size of char data type is percentage u because size is always unsigned. So I can use percentage u slash n and size of char. So this seems to be good. And let me try to compile this. So the compilation is successful. No issues with that. So some people may be having doubts. So why didn't I use percentage d that's because d is for signed integer right i know size cannot be negative right so that's why i used u that is for unsigned so even if you use d that's not an issue so that is also correct after that let me do for size of let's say short size of long and let me again do it for size of long long so let me just try size of int here and after that size of double so let me just change this to short int long 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 double let me try to compile this so the compilation is successful all right, so after that, now let's create the debug configuration. So go to debug as and click on debug configuration. And so there is already one configuration, which is for our previous project. And here now select this and double click. And it creates another one here for our current project. And here again, you have to go to the debugger, make sure that ST-Link is selected. And also the SWV is enabled. So because we are using printf, so click apply and start debugging so now it went to the debug mode and every time it is actually asking uh, this option so for me i would say just select this remember my decision and i will just click switch here and now let's go to the data console of itm and make sure that zero is being monitored here that is port zero or this is also called as channel zero of itm Actually, ITM has 32 channels and our printf works over channel zero. So that's why we are monitoring the channel zero. So channel one can be used for some other purpose. Let's say if you use RTOS or something. So if you want to get the diagnostic information of some other events, then you can use uh, channel one, channel two, channel three like that. So but by default, channel zero will be used. So that's why we are monitoring the channel zero here. And uh, let's click OK. And after that, let's start the trace, start trace. And after that, now let's use this option that is step over to execute the C statement one by one. Let's first click this step over. So here you can see that this line is executed and the size is one. That's correct, right? And next is short. So short is two, right? For this cross compiler, the size of an int is four bytes. So after that long, long is four, long, long, eight, double is eight. So a simple exercise to find out different data size of different standard data types available in C programming language. And this time we used the cross compiler, right? So, and in the next lecture, let's explore more about this IDE to browse the memory window and to understand where exactly the code is stored and uh, we'll also analyze some of the uh, disassembly code of our project. I will see you in the next lecture. Welcome back to the lecture. So in this lecture, let's see some of the compiler settings of stm 32 cube ID. So now let's go to the IDE and if you want to modify or if you want to check the compiler settings, so then you can do that. For that, you have to select the project and then right click and go to properties. So after that, just expand the C and C++ build option and here go to settings. So here you will find a various tabs. First one is tool chain version and it is actually set to default. So you can keep the same need not to change anything here. So here you can see that it is using the cross compiler. And the version is this one. 
if you want to update the version or if you want to download new tool chain, you can do that by downloading the newest tool chain by going to the ARM website. So here in this website, the tool chain can be found in uh, developer.arm.com. So you have to go to this URL and uh, here all the new ARM embedded tool chains are hosted. So this website will give you toolchain for ARM Cortex-A family of processors, also for Cortex-R and M family of processors. So you just have to go here and click Downloads. So and here you can see that this is the latest version available. So but the STM Cube ID uses, it uses actually an old version, but that's okay. Now after that, go to Tool Settings. And here you will see the microcontroller settings like uh, the board you selected, the microcontroller you are using and various other options. And here you can see that this project actually uses a reduced version of C standard library called nano library. So there are two options, either you can select standard C or reduced C. So this IDE by default uses reduced C standard library whose memory footprint is very much small compared to the standard C. And after that, you can go and explore MCU post build outputs. So for any reason, if you want to generate binary file or hex file or any other extension, then you can do so by selecting these options. So by default, uh, this project build is not generating any binary or hex file. It is generating only ELF file. So if you want binary, then you can check this. And after that, if you go to the MCU GCC compiler tab here, so here it actually lots of default compiler flags. So you cannot edit that, but you can add extra flag by using these options. So if you go to the general tab here, so in general, you can able to change the C standard, uh, which is used for your project build. So by default, you can see that it is set to GNU 11. So GNU 11 is actually, it is an extension to the ISO C11 standard. So what GNU does is, it actually takes ISO standard and then adds a GNU related extension to that standard and they call it as GNU 11. So if you want to change that and if you want to use pure ISO standard, then you can do that by selecting the appropriate standard you want. I think that would be fine, need not to change that. And after that, in the debugging, you need not to change anything preprocessor. So we'll see all these things later, include paths, we'll see that later. So optimization of the code during compilation is set to none. So I would suggest you to maintain the same. So don't change the optimization level. After that miscellaneous, so here you need not to do anything. So now let's go to the linker flags. So these are the linker flags by default. So you cannot edit this. So here you can see that it is provided with linker script and all. So these are some of the advanced concepts to understand about the linker script, etc. So we'll see that in later part of the course. But for a time being, you need not to do anything in the linker section. So you just leave that as it is. So that's it about the compiler settings, which is recommended to do. So even if you don't do these settings, that's fine. The compiler will compile with default settings. After that, what you have to do is you have to click on apply and then apply and close. So with that note, I would like to end this lecture and I will see you in the next lecture. So in the next lecture, let's learn about the compilation process. I will see you in the next lecture.